people, uh, mothers or dads, yelled at your kids on the way to church this morning? You're in church, guys. Don't be, don't be lying. I don't know any way to be but real lie. My, I grew up in a ministry family, and so, like, I totally know the mother that is acting like the devil. Very seriously. My mother was an angel for real, but every now and then we would get under her skin just enough to make her act like the devil, and the phone would ring. And then it would go from, ha, to, hello. <laughs> We're really good. Church people are really, really good at putting on a mask. We're really good at pretending everything is good. And I believe that in this era, God is done with us pretending. He's done with us playing church. He's done with us knowing the truth, but not letting it set us free because we won't live the truth. And so I'm here today to try to activate some stuff. Before we get started, I've got so, it's like a Bible class. And I kept trying to, to pare it down and he kept expanding. And so I'm just going to go really fast. Y'all listen fast, I'll talk fast, okay? Um, I, we cannot start without reading this beautiful translation of Isaiah 61, 2 through 4, that has been the theme of this entire conference. I am sent to announce, it's Isaiah 6, 1, 2 through 4, and I believe it's the Passion Translation just because of the way that it sounds. It says, I am sent to announce a new season of Yahweh's grace and a time of God's recompense on his enemies to comfort all who are in sorrow. Anyone in sorrow today? I know I've lost way too many people. I had a, a year span where six vital, crucial people in my life were gone. You don't know sorrow like that until it's just one after the other after the other. He's here to comfort all who are in sorrow, to strengthen those crushed by despair, to give them a beautiful bouquet in place of ashes, the oil of bliss instead of tears, the mantle of joyous praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. We are to live under a mantle of joyous praise where no matter what is going on around us, we're almost like this, we're like in a little bubble. It's like we, we can see what's going on, but it's not, we know it can't touch us. So we aren't given to the winds and the waves and the ups and the downs. We are steadfast. We know that God's word is true, that he's promised to give us a mantle of joyous praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Because of this, they will be known as mighty oaks of righteousness planted by Yahweh as a living display. I love the way that Pastor Roxanne said it, a a living billboard, a living display of his glory. They will restore ruins from long ago and rebuild what was long devastated. They will renew ruined cities and desolations of past generations. I don't want to be critical in any kind of way. But I heard God say specifically about McKinney, this is your father's legacy. This is his legacy. We don't let go because it already belongs to us. It is part of our inheritance. And we fight for what God has given us in the inheritance of God. And so if it was something that was, if somebody gives me something that I don't care about and somebody takes it, It's no sweat off my back. Oh, they need it more than I do. But if someone tried to take something that was treasured from me, somebody tried to take my kid, there's going to be a whole other level of fight. And there are dreams on the inside of us that we are acting like they're common, when in reality, they are our seed. They're our inheritance. They are our promises from God. We cannot treat casual the things that God has anointed, that he has placed on us. We, can, we can't call ourselves casual. We look down on ourselves as if we're not that big of a deal. And I'm all for humility. 
But there's a difference between humility and I'm not worthy. There's a difference between knowing that everything I am is only because of him and then feeling like I'm not worthy even in spite of him. God has called you. You are anointed. Do not underestimate what's on the inside of you. Do not treat it as common. Do not be apathetic about it. We have got to wage war for the things, the promises that God's given us. So as as I was reading that scripture, I couldn't help, who can read that scripture and not get stirred up? It is so exciting. It is so inspiring. But here's how I work. Y'all, I I, I preach here, but then at home, I, I clean the house. I work in the yard. I'm just a regular people, you know. So I'm out there raking leaves that probably should have been raked up three years ago, if I'm being honest. And I'm working in the yard, and I start talking to the Lord. I'm like, okay, this rebuild thing. Rebuild is the part that really, really struck me. I'm like, okay, but give me, God, give me an example of rebuilding in the Bible. Because, like, I'm going through, like, the different scriptures, and I I really am just struggling. And I'm even, like, looking up the word and the scripture and, reading all these different things, and and they're just not striking me, just right. And so I'm like, give me an example. And so he took me to Nehemiah chapter 2. And it actually, we're going to start reading in chapter 1. And when I tell you, we're probably going to read at least 40 verses today because I just can't get it, uh, you know, condensed down. But um, it's, I want for you to take time when you have time to really study this on your own to really look at it. I'm going to be reading very, very quickly, and we're going to start with Nehemiah chapter 1, and we're going to just begin with verses 2 through 6. And I'm reading out the New Living Translation. My brain understands it the best. So Hanani is my best guess at the way we say his word. One of my brothers came to visit me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had returned from their captivity And about how things were going in Jerusalem, they said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days, for days I mourned fasted and prayed to God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who kept his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people, Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. So when I was reading that, the first thing that I noticed Nehemiah doing was he inquired. He cared enough to ask. He wanted to know what's going on here. Anybody ever have like a friend who was going through surgery and then you forgot to even ask him about it, you know? We get so busy with our daily lives and I believe that if we're really going to rebuild we got to start asking some questions and go beyond the surface question, the how are you, and when they're like, fine, and you can tell that they're really not fine, but then you just brush over it and keep going because you've, you've got grocery shopping to do or you got a pig to, ki- a pig to kid up, <laughs> a kid to pick up. I'm a professional communicator, guys. Um, he cared enough to find out what was going on, and then he imagined he imagined, what must it be like for them? What, what is their real thing? Guys, we are so detached that we watch the news. We hear about families being slaughtered in other countries. And then we go and watch a movie. We, we I think it's in part because it's, it comes in so, so much that if we allowed it to really come in, we might not get back up again. 
But there are times when God is wanting us to really put ourselves in somebody else's shoes. To imagine what it must be like to live in the Ukraine. Where one day you're free, everything's great, and the next day you wake up and there are bombs coming at you. I cannot even imagine, like, do I keep my kid at home? Do I send him to school? What, what do I do? You know, and we need to put ourselves, imagine what our brothers and sisters may be facing, what they're going through. I'm not trying to bring condemnation to us, but I believe that God's calling us up higher. We need to really think about the other people. We need to really think about what's going on in this world instead of complaining about things. We need to imagine what it must be like for them. I can't imagine trying to balance some of the things that are going on. We need to imagine their needs, and then we need to ask the Lord what we can do to fill it. The next thing that he did was he interceded. Like, I think we call interceding, like, thank you, God, for doing that. Amen. And that is not the picture that we got of Nehemiah here. Nehemiah is like crying, weeping, praying, fasting. He is so concerned about this situation, this wrong that needs to be made right, that he is completely overwhelmed with it, overtaken with it. And it led him not to worry, not to like pace in the floor at night, not to like start hoarding food from the grocery store. No, it got him to intercede. He interceded for the people that were in ruins, the people that were having trouble. We right now have a country that is in ruins. We, we don't have rubble all around. But there are so many people that are still walking around with fresh wounds from COVID, from the losses that they've had, from the, the fear that they faced, from the, the challenges that were presented to them. And, and they're just, it's like they're walking around with flesh wounds. They're bleeding everywhere, and we're pretending like it's okay. And we have got to quit pretending, and we've got to start interceding. I'm not asking you to take up everybody else's problems and start carrying them and worrying about them. I'm talking about recognizing we have not only the right, but the responsibility to intercede, to stand in the gap. God is calling us. If we want to rebuild, we're going to have to intercede. How many of we, I just want to challenge you. I'm not even going to do that because it will bring condemnation because I know my truth. Praying for your church daily. Praying for your pastors and leaders. Praying, praying for our country. We have the opportunity to meet with the heaven, the maker of heaven and earth. And a lot of times we just let the day pass and we don't even say hello. If we want to see things rebuilt, we're going to have to start on our knees. We're going to have to start praying. You don't literally have to be on your knees. You just have to have that posture, that position of prayer, of knowing. And my biggest prayer, you don't have to have big eloquent prayers. When I start looking at our government, I'm just like, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Because I don't even know how to fix all that. I don't even pretend to know who should be even in charge anymore. It feels like everybody's lying. Everybody has an agenda. And I just want to go, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. You're the one that can change things. You're the one that loves America. You're the one that wants to see change. You're the one that promised this great awakening. And so we are contending. We are interceding. We're standing in the gap. And we need to do it with, intently and with stamina. Don't do it for one day. We have every tool that in our tool belt. You can put it, you, you don't have to be super spiritual and remember. Put a reminder on your phone. And then when you start to ignore it, put a louder one in. I want for you to imagine. I, I feel like I'm a pretty intense person. I love the people in my life pretty intensely. And so when somebody has a concern, I, I really pray for them. But 
I can tell you, I've never prayed like when my Uncle John was fighting for his life. I've never prayed like when I was in the hospital with my mother and the doctor was telling me, "Mm -mm." I've never prayed like that. And it's not about the outcome. It's about our part, what we do. It is time for us to recognize we are the body of Christ. She is my mother. She is my sister. Not just because we've made this covenant thing, but because we're all God's children. And we need to intercede for one another like it's our blood, like it's our kid who's out at church, like it's our family member that's fighting for their life. Don't get apathetic about it. So let's get back to the, these scriptures. Now I'm going to take you to Nehemiah chapter 2, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, it's probably Nisan, but during the 20th year of King Xerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. That really stood out to me. There should be a difference in us. We should be a joyful people. Like when we're down, it should be because there's something really to be down about. And so I, it really stood out to me that he had never been, appeared sad in the king's presence before. And, and he's the guy who serves him daily. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Then I was terrified, but I replied, Long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried, buried in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, if it pleases the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting beside him asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, If it pleases the king, let me have letters addressed to the governors of the province west in the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter Addressed to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for the house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. Number four, I want to tell you, he was so moved by what was going on in his brothers and sisters' lives that it interrupted his life. <clears throat> he didn't leave it at home. He took it to work with him. And it interrupted him in such a way that he couldn't shake it. He couldn't shake it. He had to, it was just constantly on his mind. And I wonder if we were to pray and contend and intercede like that, where it's just kind of always under our breasts, that, that prayer without ceasing, what would we see? What, what would the change be like? He His whole life was interrupted by this awakening. And his boss noticed the shift in his, counsel, in his countenance. And then he didn't just get upset and move on. He intervened. He used his connections to make a difference. He put his neck on the line. It, I thought it was interesting. It says, then I was terrified. There are times... When God's going to cause you to call you to intervene, and it's going to terrify you. But you've got to rise up and take your place and be like an Esther, knowing for such a time as this. This is why I'm here. This is why I have this favor. This is why I know this person. Be bold. Step out. He was also informed. I was so impressed. Like, he didn't have this separate meeting set up where he was going to talk about this. This was just a happenstance that the king asked him. And immediately he says, what do you need? 
And he had an answer. It's like that preparation meeting that opportunity, that, that moment of we're waiting for a suddenly. But how many of us are praying and contending, expecting God for a suddenly, but when it happens, we won't even know what to do with it. We won't have an answer. What do you, what do you need? Well, well, I don't know what I need. What, well, how much time will it take you? Well, I, I, I don't know. How much money do you need me to invest? Well, well I, bleh, bleh. we need to be prepared. We need to know the answer. We need to be informed about our flocks. We need to be informed. What does my church need the most? What, what would change my pastor's life? So that I can begin to intercede for that. He used what he knew. He illuminated. He put light on the situation to the king. The one who actually could change the situation only found out about it because Nehemiah told him. Holy Spirit wants to illuminate some things to you. It's time for you to eliminate the words I don't know from your vocabulary. Holy Spirit, who knows all things, dwells on the inside of you. That means at any point, at any time, I can have the answer. It's better than having your personal Google in your pocket. You have Holy Spirit, who knows all things, ready to tell you. You just have to ask and listen for the answer. Be still and quiet enough to listen. He's always talking to us. He wants to illuminate things to us. And he illuminated them so well. He was so passionate about it, but the king couldn't help but join the cause. He had to get involved. My sister-in-law is like the best salesperson ever. If she finds something that she loves, everybody who knows her is going to know all about it. They're going to want it. They're going to, because she just, it's just always on her lips. She's just so excited about it. She's not getting a kickback from the company. She's not getting, it's not multi-level marketing stuff. No, it's just, she's that excited about it. And that's how we need to be about this gospel. We need to be so on fire for the things of God, so on fire for what God's doing in this earth that when we tell people, when we illuminate their lives with that truth, they want to be a part. How can I be a part? How can I, how can I get a, some of that? All right. We're going to do smaller chunks now. Oh, and not only did he give what was needed, he went over and above he asked for a letter to ensure safe travel, and he sent men with him to make sure he got there safely. God is wanting to do over and above. When we do things the right way, when we are interceding, when we are illuminated by the Holy Spirit, he's going to give us that exceedingly abundantly above. Nehemiah 2.10, here comes trouble. But when Sanballat, is how I'm choosing to say his name, the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard of my arrival. They were very displeased that someone had come to help the people of Israel. There are going to be irritations. Don't be surprised by it. There are going to be haters. There are going to be people saying things that aren't true about you. There are going to be... Um, challenges that arise in your workplace. There are going to be just, we live in this real world. Don't be surprised when irritations come. The irritations, what they want to do, they want to incite insignificance. They want to make you feel it's too big. It, it's overwhelming. I can't. I'm not big enough. I'm not strong enough. I don't have enough money. I, I, I can't do that. I struggled in school before. There's no way I can go back to school. I, I, I just can't. And God says, yes, you can. It's time for that truth to be illuminated in our hearts, that we, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Jesus never struggled in school. He was really good at, he didn't even have to use notes. Like, he just, he just had it. 
Let me be more like Jesus, Lord. He didn't, Nehemiah didn't let irritation and discouragement have the final say. He responded with inspiration. Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18 says, But now I said to them, You know very well what trouble we're in. Jerusalem lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Then I told them about how gracious the hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, yes, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. Inspiration comes when we remind ourselves who we are and who our God is. We could, he could have just listened to the, to the obstacles. He could have listened to their, oh, who are you to rebuild this? You're doing this, you're doing that. But he didn't. He drowned it out with inspiration. He spoke God's truth above what he was probably even feeling in the moment. We cannot get off by ourselves. We have to stay around like-minded people that can continue to inspire us after a bad day. The enemy wants for us to get off by ourselves so he can pick us off. If you watch any nature documentary, it's that one that's over, off by himself, away from the herd, that gets eaten. Satan roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. When we feel inadequate, we withdraw. When we feel we failed, we've disappointed, we've, we withdraw. We don't want anyone to see what we think to be truth about us. But what we need to do is we need to surround ourselves with people that will inspire us to see God's truth about who we really are. These men and women of God in this, this house, they're called to call you up. To remind you of who God says that you are. To remind you of what he wants to do in your life. To inspire you to keep running, to keep serving, to keep giving, to keep on keeping on. When you've done all you know to do, stand there for. We need a tribe to inspire us. As I was writing this up, I remembered Way back when Daniel and I first got married, we went to Pastor John's church in, in uh, San Angelo, Texas, and we had a, I, it, I don't think it was specifically for young marrieds, it was probably like a college and career group, but it was a lot of young marrieds who came, and so what would inevitably happen is either at the beginning or the end, we would get together, the men would be in the living room, on the couch, the women would be in the kitchen, you know, gathering, probably eating the desserts, like we like to do sometimes. And um, we would complain. If I'm being honest, how he left the underwear on the floor that week, how he didn't take out the trash, how he, whatever. And right about that time, God started speaking to me about the importance of honor about the importance of building up. Talk about rebuilding. You can rebuild your relationship by speaking kind words. You don't have to speak lies, but you can, you can find the good in every situation. And uh, so he started talking to me about how important that was, especially to men, to feel respected. And, and so I tried... In, Please don't think I'm an expert at this because I still don't have it figured out completely. But I just really made up my mind, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to air his dirty laundry in front of my friends. Love covers. Love covers. And so we're sitting around and the griping starts. And I just immediately, I went, Really, Daniel, uh, you know, he left the underwear on the floor. He left the wet towel in the, in the laundry basket, you know, just little annoyances. And I'm like, really? Daniel took out the trash today without me even asking him to. The atmosphere shifted so quick. 
It went, well, my husband brought me flowers. Well, well, mine made the bed this morning. It was incredible to me how quickly it shifted from being a competition of how terrible my husband is to how wonderful my husband is. And we can incite that kind of change. With our words, we are able to change the atmosphere. With our expectations, we're able to do that. We need to inspire each other to love. We need to inspire each other to grace. All right. I think this is the last long bit. Nehemiah 4, 1 through 6. Sanballat was very angry when he learned that we were rebuilding the wall. He flew into a rage and mocked the Jews, saying in front of his friends and the Sumerian army officers, what does this bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something of stones from the rubbish heap and charred ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was standing beside him, remarked, that stone wall would collapse if even a fox walked along the top of it. Then I prayed, hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. That's a little bold. That's a little, that's a little, uh, do not ignore their guilt. Do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger. Woo. When they talk about the people of God, they're provoking God to anger. Here in front of the builders, at last the wall was completed to half its height around the entire city. For the people had worked with enthusiasm. You're going to run into interference. It, it's just, I would love to be a rah-rah and like we're going to rebuild, renew, restore. We're gonna, it, and it's just going to be smooth sailing. But that's just, unfortunately, that has not been my experience in this real world that we live in. You're going to have interference. I'll be bold enough to say, a lot of times it'll probably be very intense interference. Intense interference. It doesn't seem possible. It, it looks like I'm going to lose that job. It looks like not only am I not going to get the promotion, but I'm actually going to lose the job. It looks like not only is my kid not going to serve God, but they're actually out, you know, dancing in a, in a strip club. It, it not, it's, it's like this, not just a little interference. The intense interference. Why? Because it wants to get us our eyes off of the promise and on to the circumstance. The enemy has been so effective at that previously. We have gotten, we're like just a little squirrel, like little squirrel, squirrel. And it's like God will give us something, a promise, and then we just let go of it because we get distracted or we get annoyed or we get, we run into an obstacle. Too many think that if it were God's will, if God had blessed this, if God wanted this, it would be easy. No. A lot of times when I know that I'm really on the right track, it's because of the intensity of the obstacle that I'm facing. It's like, the more I'm attacked, the more I know, okay, this is the right direction. This, I'm, going, I'm not going to let go. And so many times, we are right on the cusp. We're right almost there. You can, you can come. We're right almost there, and then we relent. And we let go of what belongs to us because of interference. But we read there, and there was intentional in intercession that is the way. Pastor, Al, uh, Pastor Roxanne told us, prayer is the foundation of everything. We have been working hard. We have been trying to pick away at things for years and years and years where if we would bring it before God in a moment, he could change it. That's true in marriages. Let me tell you, you can nag somebody to the point of them digging their heels and the minute you quit nagging and you start praying, either God will change you or he'll change them. But either way, you'll quit being so annoyed. It, and it doesn't really matter. 
so long as there's peace and joy and love in the family. Job 22, 26 through 30 says, this is the message version. You'll take delight in God, the mighty one, and look to him joyfully, boldly. You'll pray to him and he'll listen. He'll help you do what you've, pro- what you've promised. You'll decide what you want and it will happen. Your life will be bathed in light. To those who feel low, you'll say, chin up, be brave, and God will save them. Yes, even the guilty will escape, escape through God's grace in your life. I woke up with the King James version of that in my head. You shall decree. Well, why wouldn't we decree? We, why wouldn't we decree? We are kings and queens. When we decree something, it is so. And I can never preach a message without talking to you about your mouth. What are you saying about your situation? What are you saying about your children? What are you saying about your family? What are you saying about your finances? Do not let frustration cause you to plant seeds that you don't want to harvest. There are days, I'll just be honest, I can't say the right things on some days. I'm too annoyed. I'm too frustrated. I'm too disappointed. But at least on those days, I make the decision. Put a guard on your mouth. Don't let anything come out. I'm not 100% at it. I'm not trying to portray that image. But it's like, okay, just like Bambi, if you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. Put a guard on my mouth. Don't let me spend time planting seeds that is going to take. Y'all know how long it takes to, to pick out weeds, right? I don't want all my time being spent picking up weeds because of things that I've said that I don't want to live. I want my words to be planting in the house of God. I want my words to be planting his church. I want my words to be planting my family and their future. I don't want my words talking about the person that my child is is dating. No, I'm going to use my words to talk about the person that God's called my child to be, that they will be. I'm going to call up. Regardless of what I see with my eyes, I'm going to say with my mouth what God has promised. I will decree a matter and it will be so. Watch what you're decreeing. Watch what you're saying. This is the thing we have to fight the most. It's our impulses. Nehemiah 4.10 says, Then the people of Judah began to complain. The workers are getting tired, and there is so much rubble to be removed. It feels like it'll never get done. We'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. Our impulse is to tear ourselves down through our words, to complain. Mama Joyce says, when you complain, you remain. If you want to go somewhere, if you want to come up higher, if you want to rebuild, you're going to have to change your impulses. Instead of giving in to that impulse that is easy, to scream and yell when you're angry, you're going to have to choose to overcome that impulse and go, Blessed are those who love thy law. Great peace have those who love thy law. I live in your peace, Jesus. My peace is in you. It's not in how clean my house is, how perfect my children are, how sexy my husband is. No. My peace is in you. No gripping, no complaining, no gossiping. I want to tell you, though, when you do give in to your impulse, repent and move on. 
when I catch myself, like I counsel people all the time. I tell them this thing all the time and then I'll be doing something and I'll, my kids will catch me in it every time. You know, it's, it's the kids that are pointing it out to me. I thought you said, yeah, I did say. And we want to, gosh, I can't believe I did this again. When am I ever going to get it? When am I? No. It's a waste of time. No guilt, no shame, no condemnation. Just get up and go again. Get up and go again. And I'm talking about repent as you're moving. Don't let it make you stay still. That's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to immobilize you. You got to keep moving. And I'm just going to go real quick over this. Like, in Nehemiah 4, 13 through 18, 21 and 23, it talks about the things that they did to keep building. It says they worked late into the night and early in the morning. They, it, it even goes so far to say they didn't even take their clothes off. They were never without the tool and the, and the, the warfare in their hand. They were building with one part and fighting off the enemy with the other. And there are some times when it feels like you don't have enough hands. Like the fight is so great that you don't have enough hands. But you know what? That's when it's time to call on the army of God, to have one another's back. They were able to continue. God gave them inventive ideas. They, half of them would watch, the other half would work. They didn't try to do things the way they had always done them before. It's time for us to embrace inventive ideas. We need to step up, grow up, and use every tool and every advantage that God has given us. A lot of us complain, it's too hard. It's, it's too hard. I've never been fighting so hard that I haven't had been able to change into my pajamas and sleep at night. I've never had to have a sword in one hand and a mason tool in the other hand. We need to change our perspective on things. Most of the things that we call tra tragedies and traumas, are really minor inconveniences. And, and I'm not talking about real trauma that's happened to you. I'm talking about <laughs> my, uh, my husband's uh, sister is extremely um, flamboyant sometimes and, and very, like, loves to talk up a story, you know. And so she'll say, she was so traumatized. And it's like because her hair, the curl didn't go just right. Like, you know, and... She didn't really mean it, but that's how it, we use those that kind of catastrophic language, and we convince ourselves that things are really worse than they are. We got to change our confession. And then I'll just leave you. Of course, we know the wall was built, and I think they said 52 days. 52 days. 52 days of doing that would be hard. But their lives were completely forever changed because they toughed it out, because they continued, because they remained. Impossibilities are ensured. We get to see the incredible, the inexplicable. We get to live in wide open spaces of grace. When we will just continue, when we will just remain, when we just remember we serve the God of the impossible. So if you are facing something that has seemed impossible to you today, I just want you to stand on your feet knowing that we serve a God of, who does the impossible. He loves. He loves to do the impossible. He loves the miraculous. We declare, God, miracles are our mainstay. It's so normal. We don't even get surprised by it anymore. Lord, I thank you that every single person that is facing an obstacle that seems too big, 
a situation that seems too impossible. I thank you that even right now, your Holy Spirit is empowering them, is strengthening them, is renewing them, that you are coming in right now and you are breathing new life, new hope, new expectation. Lord, I speak over every failing business. It's not over until you say it's over. I thank you that you are the God of the impossible. That you restore, you rebuild, you renew. God, for those marriages, the paperwork might already be being drawn up. But God, we just declare you are bigger, you are greater. You are God of the impossible. And so, well, God, we trust you with our relationships. We trust you with our marriages. We trust you with our children. We trust you, Lord God, with our finances. We trust you with our homes, God. There's someone here and it has seemed unrelenting. It has been, we're not talking an interruption. We are talking all out just an onslaught, one after the other after the other. And you just feel like every time you've fallen down, but you get right back up. But lately you felt like, I, I just can't get back up again. I'm too tired. It's too far gone. And God sees you. God sees you. You felt like you were forgotten, but God sees you. God knows you. Your name's written on the palm of his hand. He's watching out for you. God cares. God, I thank you that even right now you are wrapping your great big arms of love around them. That it's like a warm blanket enveloping them even right now. That Lord, that just as your word says that when we wait on the Lord, we'll renew, you'll renew our strength. Thank you their strength is being renewed right now. Even right now, <clears throat> the broken places of their heart are being rebuilt. There are multiple people here, and your kids are acting like they never knew the truth. They're acting like they never believed when you know that they made a personal confession. They are living in ways that, just to be very frank, it embarrasses you. You see posts that they make, and it's just, it makes you want to cringe on the inside. Holy Spirit first wants to say, it doesn't say anything about you. It's not about you. Quit worrying about what people think about you or even what they think about them. Because, I mean, as mamas, we want everybody to love our babies. Quit seeing with your eyes in the natural. And start looking with eyes of faith. See the little things, the little changes, the little, the little, it's just the, the slightest little thing change in their, in their language. Of, well, that was a blessing. Or maybe just less cursing, less, less like volatility. Celebrate those things. God is already moving. God is already on them like white on rice. He is already chasing them down with his goodness, his mercy, his grace, his love. Everywhere they go, on every side, they are here, they're inundated with God's love and his goodness. If y'all need to sit down, please don't feel like you have to keep standing. I'm sorry. They're being overtaken, overrun on every side. And it's like, I can't get away from it. God is working. Quit trying to be Holy Spirit. 
Quit trying to make them feel guilty. Quit trying to make them feel ashamed. Let Holy Spirit do the work. You pray. You fast. You intercede. And let Holy Spirit be Holy Spirit. He'll take care of it way quicker than you ever could. If you're married, I just want you to join hands with your spouse if they're here with you. Not you can just raise your hand like partnering with Jesus to, to be the one to partner with you in the marriage. God, I thank you that you have highlighted marriages today for a reason. Thank you that you're wanting to rebuild. You might already have a, a great marriage, but God's even wanting to rebuild it to be better. He's wanting, he wants the church to be filled with extraordinary marriages where people look and go, you've been married how long and you still like each other? You still touch each other? You still want to go places with each other? My brother was preaching the other day and he was talking about his wife and he says, she's my favorite human. And I thought, I wonder how many married people actually believe that about their spouse. God, make our spouses our favorite human. Let us fall in love with each other again. Let us appreciate the goodness that we have in each other. Father, when we find a husband, when we find a wife, we find a good thing. And I thank you that are a blessing to us. Father, for those that are waiting, those standing in the gap for marriages that the, the husband or the wife says no. But God, your answer is, is yes. We just thank you that for those people, that you are giving them the strength to continue, to remain, to contend. And Lord, if you are moving us to a new place because the other person is unyielding and unwilling to listen to Holy Spirit, I thank you that your grace releases us. There is no condemnation in that, Father. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for what you've done in this conference. We thank you that you have spoken words that you, we are even right now making a demand on the words that have been spoken over us. We are making a demand over the confessions that have been spoken, Lord God. The, the promises from your word, the promises from, from your heart. And we declare, God, we will have everything Jesus died to give us. We will have it. We will contend. We will intercede. We will not stand by and allow the enemy to steal what's rightfully ours. We will stand in the gap. We will be watchmen on the wall. We will see our city saved. We will see our churches filled. We will see this great awakening where people are saved, delivered, and healed. We will see your signs, wonders, and miracles because you are good and you always keep your word. In Jesus' name, amen.